<clears throat> John Thompson. Hello everyone and welcome to the parish's Friday nights live. We really miss seeing you in person, but happily we can still connect every Friday night at five and looking forward to seeing you in person in August as we uh, unfold our opening. I'm Alicia Longwell. I'm the parish's Lewis B. and Dorothy Coleman Chief Curator. And I'd like to thank our most generous sponsors who make these evenings possible. Our presenting sponsor, Bank of America and Sandy and Stephen Pearlbinder. Now, during the course of this uh, conversation tonight that I'll have with Joe Zucker, um, if you would like to pose a question, uh, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see Q&A and also um, somebody marked chat. So you can hit chat and just say hello. You can do these questions anonymously or comments. And uh, at the end, we'll, we'll have a conversation for about 35 or 40 minutes, which shouldn't be a problem, Joe, should it? <laughs> We've been talking for a lot of years. So uh, after that, uh, your comments and questions are welcome. We'll answer as many as we can. Now, Joe Zucker, this uh, conversation is on the occasion of the publication by Thames and Hudson of the first comprehensive monograph on this extensive career of Joe's, which has ranged over six decades, uh, where he has followed his ideas wherever they led. Uh, when I asked you know, Joe uh, why he decided to do the book now, he said quite simply to explain himself. Uh, in a body of work that fuses process and content and results in no single style, uh, nomenclature can be uh, a hard to encompass the whole um, uh, oeuvre. Now, this is a gorgeous book. Ooh. <laughs> Here I am, shameless product placement it's called Joe Zucker, 250 pages. Uh, somehow the entire, uh, his work has been um, divided into 10 free range chapters with titles like The Ancient World, Archaic, The American Heartland, Will It Catharize, and The Houses of Pleasure and Pain. Uh, that exactly, uh, spoiler alert, is the studio. Uh, bringing all this into crystal clear context are, uh, is the author, uh, John Elderfield, a distinguished uh, curator emeritus, a chief curator emeritus, of painting and sculpture at the Museum of Modern Art with essays by Terry Myers, a writer and independent curator who probably knows, has probably been in the studio with Joe uh, more than any other writer who knows the work. Uh, Alex Bacon is a cur cur curatorial associate at the Princeton Museum of Art. And Fong Bui, uh, the founder, uh, publisher and artistic director of the S-Mobile Brooklyn Rail publishing a, a wonderful interview he made with Joe. Um, great support went into this book uh, from uh, uh, collectors and, and, and supporters of Joe, including Agnes Gunn, Christine and Andy Hall, David Ray, Michael Strauss, Julia Reyes Taubman, and Robert S. Taubman. Beautiful design by Phil Kavakovich and edited by Christopher Sweet. Now, just a few words about Joe, born in 1941 in Chicago, Illinois, in a neighborhood de he describes as lower middle class and, and uh, rising working class, blue collar. Often he was taken to the Art Institute of Chicago by his mother as a child. He felt he was almost preordained, preordained to be an artist. He attended uh, his, his undergraduate degree is from the School of the Art Institute and his MFA from uh, the School of the Art Institute as well. He, um, the first time he went to make a painting, uh, it was something about uh, the surface that, um, the surface, he wanted the surface and the process to be as evident as the image and the painting. And this led to a whole lifetime of work what I want to show now and we want to uh, see together is a brief clip. It's only about three minutes. It's, a, it's an interview that Joe did for the School of the Art Institute. Uh, I think it's a fabulous recruitment <laughs> video. It speaks, as I've heard very few uh, artists be able to articulate, it speaks to the, um, the calling that being an artist is. It speaks to obligation. It speaks to vocation and 
Uh, it's a wonderful insight uh, into the work. So we'll watch this and then come back to start this conversation. Thank you. Seems like a bit of technical difficulty here. Victor, can you hear me? Yes. Should we forge on? country the the it was the perfect style the perfect format where everything could be included the material the the historic if you can't get something out of making art don't do it i don't care what it is i don't care how perverse it is if you got it in for people if, or, or whatever it is you better want to do it i have been generally a believer that um that the more you know the better you are as an artist that if you can draw a hand great if you understand philosophy great if you're interested in theoretic physics wonderful because i think that all provides a wellspring for possible ideas and there are people who have hidden talents and if you allow a diversity in your program as well as in the art world itself there's a place where that kind of person can take that kind of intellect and apply it and make something creative there's the international style of diversity, video, performance, painting show, sculpture show, collages. This is becoming a style in a sense. No style is becoming a style. And I can relate to that. So I have, what would you call it, copacetic feelings about people that are much younger. Empire descending the staircase had to do with the deterioration of this country. That that it was the perfect style, the perfect format, where everything could be included: the material, the the historical references, the neoclassic style, the 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 reference back to a kind of painting which very much influenced. Uh, French masters. So I, I was able to take a, a, a body of things and put it together in what I thought was a very tightly constructed show, like not one quarter inch out of place. I thought that the paintings looked good. I was mostly concerned about the relevancy, the literal aspect, because as you know from some of my early work, it sometimes goes far afield in terms of political references and fairly obnoxious assertions, depending on the material they're constructed of. Collectors spent money, museums own my work. I have an obligation, I'm a professional. I'm not so involved in myself that I don't realize that there's obligations, that that's part of it. I owe a lot to the school. So that's why I'm interested in sort of helping out if I can someone's so much.
So let's <laughs> unmute Joe. <laughs> Hi. I, I wish every young painter in school or artist in school could hear that. Uh, I went there uh, not too many years ago and did studio visits. Right. And I was last time I was there, they generously provided me with an honorary doctorate degree, which made me feel that all those years there was worth it. Exactly. Exactly. I think so in this video, you talked um, a bit about you were looking at empire descending a staircase. Um, and we thought we would talk about the, the chapter in the book, uh, which is about uh, ancient history, art, archaic, and, and, and look at that selection of about 12 paintings that to see in a way how the book comes together, you called it in a way a vertical book, um, and how uh, the paintings are grouped together. We might start, start there. Well, now, okay, go ahead. To, to look at the, the body of work. Uh, one way is, is, uh, is to see it when accompanied by many other paintings that in essence, I've been working on one painting for 50 plus years. <laughs> Added to that, if you want to go the way of a literal interpretation, I choose to think that actually the chapters give, uh, give credibility to the notion that really the book is a portrait of me. Uh, I don't do self-portraits. Uh, everyone I've ever attempted to come without some sort of scarecrow. <laughs> uh, um, I think it can go either way. Uh, I did not want to do a book that was involved with linear art history. Right. Um, that uh, because I don't operate in a way in which I think the series that comes after the series, after the series, after series, has to be better than one than the other mm -hmm. um, in order to move on. And, and uh, I think the book is more of a work in itself because it allows me by using those titles to put more than one style sometimes in a category, uh, which enhances the other pictures in that, in that group. Absolutely, uh, it gives the context. So what, um, what do you think, what do you mean when you say style? I mean, I know you've said that studying at the Art Institute, it was Picasso School of Paris, Picasso School of Paris, that that was the style that was dominant in instruction. Well, you, you were taught, uh, when I went to school, on graduate school at the School of the Art Institute, mm -hmm. uh, we were taught by a group of European modernists, uh, to faculty, who believed a lot in the gesture, uh, a lot, um, creating, giving, taking away, giving, taking away, and um, a lot of faith. I think that people who have a lot invested in the emotion of painting buy into a kind of religious position where if you've had a bad day in the studio, you can knock a couple back. And when you wake up in the morning, maybe you've had a breakthrough. You dash to the easel and magically, because you've been a good boy during the night in your dream, something good has happened. I don't work like that. I don't have that kind of faith. Um, uh, I don't really have favorite painting. I don't see my work progressing because it's a oneness it's by itself. However, like in the case of the, the uh, emperor descending of staircase, I have history in terms of classicism. 
there's at least five sets of painting going back to 97, 1970 rather. The why don't we start, Joe, excuse me, why don't we start the slides, Victor, we'll come up with the images now and this will begin the chapter. Okay. Is that okay? On Art, Art K, there's the book. Next. It in itself is one of the styles of art of this archaic. Uh, it's a painting, they're mosaics of mosaics. So uh, I had to make a drawing with the right scale That's great. Uh, for the cotton balls to fit in there. This mm -hmm. is number, this is the third or fourth painting that has to do with classicism in the group of five or six sets. Um, there's uh, five paintings uh, in the series. But what will happen is I compare, I compete series to series because a lot of the works do have a, a literal meaning and I want to have them as effective as possible. So, uh, it depends how, how the whole group resonates with me when I'm finished. So this, uh, for, for those, uh, we might say what this is an image of. Um, it, it's Justinian. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Theodora, the, emperor, right. the Holy Roman Emperor, the Empress. Uh, uh, she was a, an extremely powerful woman in her day. And it was a suitable group of images that related to that mural at, at uh, Ravenna that could accompany her. Uh, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's one of my, it is one of my favorite series of paintings out of like, I don't know, I have 80 styles of painting. <laughs> at least. Uh, now that are not hot, that are laid back. They may be ingratiating. They may enter the threshold of beauty. Uh, I often talk about the relationship between two versions of uh, 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 St. Francis. Right. This mm -hmm. painting at the Frick by Bellini is a gentle, unarmed, disarmed painting, while the Zuberon painting in Spain of St. Francis is almost fabric. It has very little color, muted brown. It sort of is a skull and a face and a lot of cloth. So right. down through history of my work, I am very careful about juxtaposing style as a metaphor where it's hot or cold. Uh, I might do a, a, a cold group of paintings and then the next group might have to be a horrendous subject matter that's very aggressive because the two play off. It's sort of like if you look at Western painting, it's like uh, the Bellini is like, if not decorative, it's engineered love and faith and belief. Right. Because the Zuberon is about the development of form and space in Western painting. Mm -hmm. and, and these things continue all the way to Picasso and beyond. The Picasso show verse Matisse is exactly what I'm talking about. Picasso, what is dimensional, illustration of form, Matisse of his almost, I want to touch it, I want to wrap it around me. <laughs> and I stick I like it. <laughs> rather, than yeah. to, rather than trying to develop a style, I let material tell me the style. Mm -hmm. um, so this is cotton balls, it's perfect. Uh, these were one hand cotton balls. Later on, I went on to incorporate a second hand. I couldn't understand why my arm was hanging there. <laughs> uh, I felt guilty. I needed to do more work. And of course, it led my work into making ersatz 
paint stripes. Mm -hmm. And it, it enabled me to become uh, sort of a, a New York Fragonard, I, I, I might say, in a, in, with regard to certain paintings that are um, a kind of expressive in that sense. Victor, uh, maybe the next slide. Go ahead. Yeah. Now, Joe, for those who may not be as familiar, when you say cotton ball, you mean cotton ball, right? Well, I mean, the best of the line from Johnson and Johnson. Okay. Uh, on a side, I uh, I wrote them a letter uh, asking for free cotton balls. <laughs> and, uh, I got a letter back that said, we'll send you a crate of 300, but we've got people who need the cotton balls more than you do. <laughs> All right. Little do they know. <laughs> um, the cotton ball thing happened while I was teaching mm -hmm. in Minnesota. 1967, I had a, for my section of the color class, my class, I had to come up with a project that all the students could work on because self-indulgent was out. The war was raging. Uh, people were indulging on many levels. Uh, so I saw cotton ball. Somehow uh, it connected with what I had been doing at the art school. So we did a huge mural, like 30 feet by 10 feet, where the students rolled the color, cotton balls in pools of color, let them dry, and then stuck them on the campus. And so the real origin of using this as a mosaic form took place in uh, 1967. That's yeah. amazing. The next slide, Victor. And Joe, uh, you're, you're uh, one of the writers for the catalog. Next slide, Victor. Uh, Terry Myers has just, um, in the chat room, he has said, another great fact about these five mosaics is they are supposedly each made of the same number of balls. Yeah, <laughs> because I made five rows of paint uh, when I was doing this type painting. And uh, when they were dry enough to handle, but still wet, I had five canvases and I put two in each painting. Mm -hmm. And that gave me and I that allowed me to paint, make sure that the the paint mark um, was uh, uh, in the correct place in the drawing. Most of my work has been made flat on a table. And that's why any of the really big paintings are multi-panel because uh, I, I, I can't reach and, uh, far enough to work on them. Now, I think the next, the next slide will take us into another, what, still in this chapter of art. Uh, these are- Okay, yeah. Uh, this painting is in Fort Worth. It has five five by seven panels. The reason I like these, the, the material when sodden is like clay. So I see this as a metaphor where the wet sodden material is clay-like. And when put on these amphora, which are a little foreboding, of course, um, they, reinforce the sense of object because these are about an inch thick, these paintings. This is one painting, 25 feet long by seven feet. Uh, oh. There's two sets. The other set is a little gloomier, but it's the same thing. It's like, it's like a kind of, Mirandi, in a way, what Mirandi aims for, that kind of clay-like plasticine surface. So are these hot or cool? 
they're cool. They're okay. systemic. They're very systemic. Right. Uh, next. That's the complete. That's the others. Okay. Yeah. See these boxers here on the end? On my, there, there's a buffalo, there's a figure, and there's some boxers. Part of the whole reason I'm doing this, and it's a major part of my work, is to avoid using my skill. <laughs> that I did not want to conceptually try to invent a, a style that was abstract or not abstract or abstract and not abstract by making the tool, the cotton ball, a kind of tool, it was very hard to do anything that was too elaborate, too, too, too illustrative, not physical enough of a painting. And uh, Chuck Close and I used to talk for hours about procedure and process, how you could take away, you could, you could mute, you you could you could put your hands to use in a way which they were suitable for the series of paintings you were working on, and um, uh, it, it, uh, as as an aside, uh, Chuck Close is one of the most gifted artists technically, that perhaps in the top hundred of ever uh, his skills. So uh, he. We figured uh, this problem out. It's in all, almost all of my work, it's a consideration. Now, someone has asked, what is Roplex? Roplex? Yes. Not to use a chemical that is waterproof and is, can be used as a painting medium, comes in 55 gallon drums. It's a lot cheaper than buying Liquitex painting medium, which is like 17, was $17 a gallon, but now it's $80 a gallon. It's sort of toxic. It gives you a sort of high when you use it, when you're mixing the paint that's gonna be in there. You wanna turn on your Michael Jackson album sort of, it, 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 there's something that, that comes from it that's uh, uh, euphoric, but as it turns out, it's not dangerous. And okay. one, we were very concerned that the fumes um, were dangerous. Uh, Fong has just observed that Joe, this is Fong Wui of the Brooklyn Rail, Joe as an artist is identical to a philosopher of pragmatism. Discuss. Joe, this is from Fong. Joe, as an artist, is identical to a philosopher of pragmatism. Uh, um, I, I sort of let the moment, um, uh, uh, I hover on philosophy in a way in which John Raywald touched on, but basically, the philosophy I'm involved in is the philosophy of tactile reality. Mm -hmm. And that if things are tactile, uh, they become transferable sort of by the terms of craft from one generation to another. Um, my paintings are somewhat like Ad Reinhardt's in that the people are touching them more often than not. And um, uh, I would say that that's sort of how I feel about their, 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 their philosophy is really about them going out the door with a different skin, each group. Mm -hmm. All right, next, Victor, please. These are the earlier ones. These are amphora. Mm -hmm. um, these are curious because they have, they're done with chiaroscuro to round them. And uh, 
light the dark, like what I was talking about. These are hotter. Uh, the one thing about these that are unusual, and it's because they were only the second set of cotton ball paintings I made, is these light high tones have white mixed into the paint. And that's very rare for my work because white deadens the color and grays it. So if this had been Roplex, it would have been transparent and those areas would have been much lighter, probably more space in the painting. Thank you. Next. There's a couple. The same series, yeah. Now I think the next one will get into a completely different way of making a painting. Next. Victor, thank you. Okay, great. Great. This is where we're getting near classicism. Yeah. I love, I, I like a lot of the surface of the Clifford Still paintings. Mm -hmm. When I went to the Art Institute, there was a beautiful giant Clifford still that looked like a highway somewhere in Kentucky. It was uh, pockmarked with open for sensibility. And I also like the thing that went on in, in Pompeii, right? Where they had that volcano. There was a gloominess to it, but the lava was to die for. Uh, this, these paintings also uh, make themselves. This is a crepe. Uh, my thinking here about pragmatism and all this is why not put the painting in its own crate so they can take it to the basement in the museum easier? Right. It, it's like this is the sky. This is the volcano with green lava. And these paintings are, met, are created like dancing. Uh, I, I, myself, or myself and an assistant would pick up the panel, pour, let's say we poured the, the green, all of the green paint winds up on this side and then I'd put it on blocks so it'd stay there. So these paintings in essence are mathematically composed, but they paint themselves as in, in my way of thinking about them. And here's an atrium. It has a classical format, but the atrium, it has a, a table, it has the columns, mm -hmm. two chairs. And this is literally two separate panels that have a frame around them that are closed, right? They're among my favorite paintings. And when I really get nasty with these, I pick a day when it's cold and the water in the paint dries fast so that I can take an area like this. And if it's a cold day, put the rope, mix the paint, pour it in, and what happens, the paint retracts because the cold air causes it to, to compress and you get a fantastic surface, which is done by itself. So I'm not there struggling. Like in, when I was in graduate school, oh, oh, this, I don't like that. I, I was able to control the surface of this type of painting. And then I could walk away from it. How great is that? <laughs> Next, Victor. Here are two more. Here's some, here's some more uh, ships. Uh, I've done a lot of paintings of ships. Uh, uh, these are ones of my more popular ones that are also that I, I care about. Uh, uh, this series was very effective. Mm -hmm. Okay, next, Victor. Okay. Uh, here we are. This is, um, this is about classicism and my attraction for the work of say Diego Rivera, who I'm admired a lot because his fresco techniques 
led him to a kind of primitive image of figures, a kind of image that mirrored the fact that it was the patron, the stubby figure with the bag of fruit over the shoulder. Um, he, I believe a lot of his work was dry fresco, which meant it was a surface prepared and then he used duco paint, water-based paint. And uh, I liked how he dealt uh, with politics. Um, uh, the painting in Detroit, everybody who's an art student should see the Rivera installation. Yeah. It's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, um, <clears throat> this is, this is, Every single inch is divided into quarter inch modules. This is, uh, again, the columns and tablature <coughs> steps going back to the, the outside with the green field. Um, mm -hmm. There's a number of these. This is the first series of the, uh, what I, the gypsum paintings, which is, a form of wallboard, which is like plaster. The beauty of it, it and watercolor are kissing cousins. Every time you touch a dot on that plaster, it goes and then you go to the next dot. The watercolor, just the, the encaustic or the, the plaster just eats the, is eaten alive by this plaster. And uh, God forbid you make a mistake with these. You drew, if you have the wrong math, you make one row out of the wrong place, the whole thing's ruined. So just, just to make it clear to everyone, this is a piece of basically gypsum or wall, wallboard, yes? Yes, and the reason it works is I tried to have plaster made to paint on, it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, it's too heavy, it's fragile. You can't, couldn't make a plaster painting as large as this. So the wall, you, you, you peel the paper off the wallpaper, I mean, off the wallboard. It's excruciating. When you cut the grid with an X-Acto knife, it helps to get, you put, prepare it away. And with an X-Acto knife, you can flick the paper off and then you have a completely you know a piece of uh, wallboard that's vulnerable let me put it that way and and it really this is a pu perfect marriage of what i'm talking about waiting for the right matchup between materials before starting a painting i just started on some new things i waited i, I waited four months before I thought something that even had a chance of, of being uh, accomplishing that kind of thing. The, the series after this is a different type of wallboard. They, they started to, they stopped making this type. We had an electric sander to get the paper off. Oh. It was a nightmare. Let's go to the next slide, Victor. Thank you some more of those. Yeah. Let's go to the next slide. Hmm. This series is so beautiful. All right, the next slide, we're gonna to come to. How about this painting? Now this is, uh, this is a good example of hot and cold, pleasurable and not pleasurable. Mm -hmm. uh, this is like the south of France. You know, like uh, there, I didn't have room for the flags to be blowing in the breeze, but this is acrylic. It's not watercolor. It's a, called regatta. There's 12 of these. Um, the basic structure of these is very similar to paintings I made in 1963. Grid paintings that were 
painted exactly the same way, acrylic, uh, water, and um, uh, uh, didn't have it didn't have a a, 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 a a what do you call it? Didn't have a medium. It's just water. Mm -hmm. um, they're very similar, but they're not as they don't have a sailboat in them. The reason I use sailboats a lot, and uh, several people have uh, pointed out to me that the logic, I'm stretching the logic, but essentially sailboats are wood, a lot of wood and canvas. And they can quite often be like that. So a number of paintings of mine use that metaphor uh, my friend uh, uh, Hamza Walker, uh, I was telling him about the pirate paintings and that they employed this logic that they were wood and cloth. And Hamza said, that's going too far. You're not gonna get away with that with me. But we're, we're, we're not talking about 100% here. We're talking about enough of a percentage that it produces a series of paintings that have a meaning of their own. So this is a, a walkthrough, you might say, of one chapter. There are nine more, and it's an extraordinary way of looking, show that you brought us, of looking at your work. We have a lot of great comments. Why don't we go um, to some that have come in? Um, uh, let's see, we've heard from uh, O'Donna DeSalvo. She says that uh, the paint, like Sacco and Vanzetti, the piece you made for the parish, there's in fact a piece embedded in the walls of the historic parish on Job's Lane, right? Tell us a little bit about that, of Sacco and Vanzetti. Well, I made a number of portraits on one, what were they, the two foot square? two foot square pieces of, of uh, gypsum, which is now what you use uh, uh, to paint with the watercolor. Mm -hmm. I, I put those in categories, but the one that, that Donna is referring to was Sacco and Vansetti. Um, and the whole notion of, of, of making these portraits of just the eyes uh, was if you could find the perfect people to be looking out. Like in my home, I have one of those portraits of the Rosenbergs. Mm -hmm. And I, that's the kind of ironic humor that occasionally something allows me to do. There's nothing, you know, there they are looking out. They're guilty. They're t spies, they're traitors, they're trapped. And then when the show ended, we didn't take the Rosenbergs out and liberated them. We put molding over them. We put dap over them. And they live forever in the old parish art museum. They do. Um, uh, Victor, I think we can take the slides down because we're just going to look now at a few more questions, maybe. Uh, that's interesting. You know, um, uh, a Fong said he had to leave, but he did. He further explained his uh, uh, suggestion of the pragmatism. Um, Fong says, John Dewey believes that there would ne should never be a division between vocational um, learning and academic training. Joe similarly embraces both craft and art as a unity of making. Me? Yeah, you, well, Joe. I have an unusual a uh, career as um, uh, f f f faculty. Um, I started out at visual arts. I was invited there by my Yaley friend, Don y Nice, mm -hmm. offered me a job and I took it. So I went to, this is 1970, 68. And so I was immediately thrown into the craziness of visual arts. I don't want to go on about visual arts. It was a very tough time with the war and all that we were involved. But, but, the, but the fact of the matter was 
the kids were involved in the, the kids were blue chip students. They were blue collar students. It was mm -hmm. like a craft school. Mm -hmm. uh, I have one story that I must tell where uh, I was teaching first year painting and I, I gave the kids an assignment. I said, go out and find a famous work of art. The greatest <laughs> one you can find, find something wrong with it and correct it. You make the corrections on this. It's a good one. Back next week. So sure enough, I walk in the freshman painting class and there's the kid and he's got a portrait of Van Gogh. And you can imagine what he did. He put the ear back on. He <laughs> received and immediately got an A for the semester for impeccable logic. So, so those kids were tough. Uh, then I've also taught at the academic schools that um, with a di whole different type of teaching, different mm -hmm. expectations of the students, ranging from Brown to Princeton, Yale, Harvard, etc. cetera. So um, I've had been rewarded in, in that respect that I've gotten a close look at art students. Uh, um, um, my theory with art students is, is that I've, one of the reasons I've done fairly well, two reasons. One, I treat them as an equal, especially graduate students. Right. And, and the other thing is, is I, I just don't, I, I don't let them, I, I don't let them bother me. If, if, if what they're <laughs> If I can't invent something for them to think about, that's it. I have nothing to give them. Because usually, and my wife would attest to this when she goes along, that you can you go from good to bad to bad to good and you you, you accept it. You don't you, you sort of uh, take it for what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I do feel, and I, you know, I, I've been to the University of Kentucky, uh, a lot of different places, uh, different times, and and uh, yeah. so uh, I look at. But the teaching um, is itself. Uh, I don't. I, I don't talk about people painting. Uh, anything, doing anything like I do, because I'm afraid what I do is, is me. And I can't sell a style out of myself. I think that people sometimes find the paintings interesting because they're not styles. The materials make them, give them a style. So I, 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 I I, 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 uh, I'm not, uh, I, I can deal with both uh, uh, positions. The... Joe, John Elderfield is asking, how about writing an autobiography? My autobiography? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, um, I think it would be interesting to do um, uh, we're working on a documentary, but one of the problems is I go far afield. I get out of control. I start talking about certain things that, uh, uh, you know, are of questionable uh, relevance, but- uh, Well, that's the, best, that's the best part, Joe. I don't think anything, you, you never get that far afield. You always come back to I lived, uh, I lived through a lot of stuff uh, on the south side of Chicago that was very unpleasant. And uh, I, uh, uh, John is, is, is right in a sense. Then I, years later, uh, I dealt with the problem of the racism that I grew up under by mm -hmm. becoming an assistant basketball coach. I gave 
back to what I perceived as unfair and often violent. So uh, um, if I had somebody that could do the grammar and take out the ain'ts and the don't, <laughs> I might be tempted. Uh, uh, this is the way, you know, uh, you hit on an interesting thing, John. Um, uh, when I was five years old, I started reading the New York, I mean, the Chicago Tribune. Uh, mm -hmm. I wrote a lot. I wrote reviews for the Chicago Tribune's art when I was in graduate school. Wow. Um, and I had high SAT scores in, in English. I, 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 and I felt that I looked at myself as I advanced in art school and took a longer look at myself and decided I better make use of my mirth. But I can't disregard. I know art is very serious and I, I'm sure I've accounted for that in my life. But I, I realized that, that I couldn't throw away my ability to conceptualize things in a humorous way. So don't ever, don't ever lose that, Joe. That's how, how you get through the day, right? You have to. Do you have a shout out from Charles and uh, Shana Zucker in Montana? Yep. Hi, guys. Donna asks, uh, are there paintings in the Art Institute that you sort of grow, grew up walking by? Um, any others you'd comment? You mentioned the still. I looked there. Yeah. Or, or, well, I went to the Art Institute from the time I was five years old. Yeah. My mother uh, shoved me there with a, a, some big scale spelted markers and some sandwiches. <laughs> and I, and I wound up going through the front door by the lions. I saw everything. And I honestly believe that my multi styled, my inability to commit to a certain thing was because every day I went there, I saw great things. How could you reject Tintoretto in favor of Franz Klein? And uh, I, I think that that is all psychological. I, I didn't think about that until maybe 10 years ago that I was imprinted with the collection. Uh, um, it's it's uh, it's it, 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 it's quite uh, my one of my favorite paintings uh, out of all paintings uh, uh, five ten top selection is Van Gogh's bedroom in Arrow, mm -hmm. which commanded great interest for me because first of all it was fucked up it, it had a lot of damage done to it and it was so unbelievably hopeful with this relationship with with Gauguin, uh, not a big painting, but big in terms of, of input. Uh, uh, people are surprised that I'm not so interested in the, in, in uh, uh, I can't remember, the Grand Jacques. Uh, Sir, uh, I, I like his drawings better than the painting. Yeah, they are amazing. The drawings are amazing. Yeah. Day, the curator of drawing, Mark, took me down in the basement and we opened up the, the file and took a look at those drawings. Those are quite amazing. Now, some keen eye, I think Terry Myers has spotted someone over on the couch, Joe. We're going to have to wrap it up here in a few minutes. Who's over there on the couch? <laughs> The most famous beagle in the world. <laughs> the question, is he a beagle? We get that two or three times a day. Oh, really? I never let him in the studio. He's too dangerous. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this has been extraordinary. A lot of other uh, comments, everyone. Uh, uh, I, I'm glad to share this because some of my 
finest moments in my brilliant career have been sitting and talking with you, mostly listening because uh, uh, you talk about art and paint and politics and music like no one I've ever really known. Well, and you might have, I don't know if everyone heard the Highway 61 Revisited, which was streaming a bit in the background. I hope we don't get caught for playing that, but uh, talk a minute about Highway 61 and Dylan and yeah, well, the North Country. Maybe I'll think of that. What? Maybe I'll, 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 pause, I'll give pause to that thought. Okay. All right. Uh, this has been terrific. Thank you very much. Thanks to Britta, your uh, archivist and partner and mother of Wally <laughs> for all the help in putting this together. I couldn't be more grateful for this moment. Yeah. And here. Yeah. Oh, performance of producing the book, <laughs> whether it's me or mother, the biggest painting you ever made. I know, yes. I know. When when we open when we reopen in August, please come see. There's a spectacular painting uh, of Joe's on view in the galleries, and we will have the book in the uh, shop. Shameless product placement. It's a fantastic and a very beautiful book, and to be to be held and opened and contemplated for a long time. Wonderful essays, and thank you, Joe. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. Thank <laughs> you.